small blessing from us looking at the word together, but the blessing truly is mine to be here. I was um, thankful to help Dr. Blazing out. Ryland's in my class teaching for me. I know he likes to move around sometimes because he teaches in that really early hour, and uh, so he can fill in for me sometimes. Um, um, talking about legacy, um, I, I was reminded of Dr. Blazing. Um, you know, his father recently passed away. Stephen Boyd was down at the memorial service in Waco. I remember seeing him and went down there. And uh, recently, in the last month, Dr. Blazing stepped out of the administrative role. Most of you have heard this probably. And uh, he's a distinguished research professor now at the seminary. But I have worked for him for 12 years, going back to 2006. And so I'm still processing not be working closely with Dr. Blazing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I appreciate your prayers for me as you're praying for him in that transition. I think he's fine. He's giddy. He just wants to write and research. So he's all excited. Uh, those of us who work closely with him and, you know, are, are adjusting. But I appreciate your prayers. What I was going to say about the memorial service, though, is um, I learned some things some things made better sense about who Dr. Blazing is after hearing what he said and what, what all was said about his, his dad. Um, and just how Dr. Blazing loves people, um, that, that, well, that was from his dad. His dad instilled that in him. Um, um, this calm demeanor and this ability to endure um, and persevere and endure suffering that came from his mom and his dad, and it was a special time. So I appreciate being here today. I think Dr. Blazing told me that this was Diane's last surgery in regards to her cancer, um, the last planned surgery. So um, this is a, a blessing, and we praise the Lord for that and pray that she is uh, recouping at home. Well, let's look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24 through 26. How in the world, three, three chapters here, how, how are we going to cover? Um, was it Steve, I think, that asked me how long my lesson is today? I said about two, two and a half hours. Um, that's the problem because I can't go that long. I assure you we're not going that long. We're going to be out of here. And the reason we're going to be out of here is Dr. Day's here today to sing. Uh, with the choir. Um, I haven't seen a bulletin today, but I know that that was the plan, and he was here Wednesday night. He told me the song he's singing, and I'm so excited um, to hear it because it's going to be a special, special song, one he has not sang before anywhere. Um, and so this is a new song for him, a new song for the choir, I believe, and I'm excited. So I'm going to have us out of here, and I might run you know, out of here, just so I can get there and hear this. Let's look at 1 Samuel 24 to 26. The title of today's message uh, is Allowing the Lord to be the Judge and Avenger in My Life. This te these texts are so rich here, we could concentrate on a number of different aspects, but we're going to concentrate um, primarily on this idea of David um, allowing the Lord to be the judge and avenger in his life. And as we do that, um, think about um, if we're doing this in our lives. Remember, um, the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel, probably for one book, um, originally constituted one book. Um, basically what's going on in First and Second Samuel is a transition from uh, a king or judgeship to kingship okay we have the establishment of the monarchy there's a transition of leadership from the priest Eli to the judge Samuel um, and then from Samuel to King Saul and then to King David this is not just history for history's sake this is theological and you probably can't see that I'm sorry it's dark and it's small um, but what this shows is kind of the extent of Saul's kingdom. So the setting for 1 Samuel is a transition between the judges and the monarchy, um, the, king, the kingship idea. 
And then we get into 2 Samuel, and again, you can't really see this, but it's just a lighter shade of kind of a blue. This is um, David's kingdom at the beginning of his reign, which essentially is the same as um, the extent of Saul's kingdom. And then the larger area, the gr big green area, is David's kingdom at the end of his reign. And so this kingdom expands here. Um, so where are we in chapters 24 to 26? Well, um, there's a couple of diff there's several different ways to outline the book. Um, the books. First Samuel, we have the story of Samuel transition to the monarchy. The story of Saul and um, the story of Saul and David, starting in chapter 16, going all the way to the end of the book, and that's where we are, right in the middle of that, when we get to 24. Another way to outline this you would have the introduction of Samuel. Remember the ark narrative, the ark being taken by the, the Philistines for a time, God judging the Philistines, the ark coming back on the cart and um, with, the, um, with the cows who weren't trained, and, and then they make an offering to the Lord. The institution of the monarchy, God uses Samuel in this process. And remember... They ask for a king because all the nations have a king. and um, Samuel warns them. It makes them angry um, that they want a king. But God says, let them have a king. Saul is going to be the king. So we've got the reign of Saul, 13 to 15. And then David's rise to power because Samuel, uh, Saul makes some foolish mistakes, remember. And ultimately... Samuel tells him, your, your kingship's not going to endure, your house is not going to endure, endure, but God is going to make your neighbor a king. And then it comes back at the end of 1 Samuel and uses that phrasing, we know who it is, it's, it's David. Um, and so we have David's rise to power, and that's right here, um, starting with his first challenge with Goliath. Uh, this is small too, I'm sorry about that, um, we're... Right here, David sparing Saul, and we have two parts to this as we go through this. So today, we're looking at chapters 24 through 26, and in these chapters, we see Saul's continued pursuit of David, and rather than fleeing, David has been just fleeing, remember, in the past, um, and he had this... Um, relationship began this covenant relationship with Jonathan Saul's son and they um, uh, they covenant together and Jonathan doesn't believe that his father is after David and so he they make up this plan he's not going to show up at the new moon feast David's not and and Saul becomes angry even to the point of kill, trying to kill his own son Jonathan his anger is just um, burning within him. Um, and then they covenant together. Um, Samuel, or Jonathan comes back and communicates through the, the thro um, shooting of the arrows and the communication with the young boy that he needs to go. They come together and meet and embrace, and then Saul flees again. But today, uh, what we're looking at in these chapters, David doesn't flee like he has in the past God gives him in his providence the opportunity to take Saul's life on two occasions and in between these occasions um, David and his men are scorned by a rich man Nabal and David makes a decision to kill every male in Nabal's household but Abigail comes along Nabal's wife and intercedes but in all <clears throat> three occasions, we see the example of David's Godward perspective in this. By God's grace, David understands that judgment for him being wrong is in the Lord's hands. Not in his own hands, it's in the Lord's hands. And we, we come to the clear understanding, we get a clear picture from David's example here, that the Lord avenges his people in his own way in his own time and it's not for us to avenge 
So look at this. We're not going to be able to read through this whole text, obviously, um, all the verses. I'll do some um, summarizing at points. But I do want to start off by reading uh, the first seven verses of chapter 24. Um, right before this, David goes and he goes into the strongholds of En Gedi. Um, and <clears throat> um, he is being pursued by Saul, but Saul got a messenger to come to him in verse 27 of chapter 23 and says, The Philistines have made a raid on the land. And so Saul has to um, abandon his pursuit of David for a time to go take care of that matter. But here we are at chapter 24, verse 1. Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. The men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. It came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him, because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. So Saul's pursuing him and um, all of a sudden, it says Saul needs to go in to relieve himself. Literally, in the Hebrew, it says to cover his feet. Um, he was going in, I don't want to be crude here, but it's a number two here. That's what the language means. He's covering his feet. He's taking um, his inner garment down, and his feet would be covered because he's going to the bathroom. And um, he has no idea that David is in this cave with all his men. Now, we're we're t just told in the recent verses that David, by this time, has uh, several hundred mighty men who have um, gathered around him. Are they all in this cave? It's just amazing to me that Saul goes into this cave and doesn't hear them. Um, but without Saul knowing, um, David uh, goes up behind him uh, to the side of him and cuts off an edge of his robe. But... Um, but the men of David had said to him, this, the whole, this day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, as you, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Now we're not told that these men of David, um, it was revealed to David that he was supposed to do anything to Saul. They're interpreting this general idea that the Lord has, has said to, to David um, in this particular uh, occasion, but we don't, we're, nowhere in the scripture does it give us indication that God wanted David to do something, harm Saul. But this is what they say. He cuts off part of the robe and then he feels his conscience. His conscience bothers him in verse 5 that he has done something deceptive and he, um, he gets, uh, maybe he had a thought of doing something evil but his conscience bothers him, um, and he says to his men, I also think there's something there, it's just a disgrace to cut, to cut the, the king's robe, period. Um, and so his conscience bothers him, and he says to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. And so he comes out, and in verses 8 to 15, um, Saul goes out of the cave, and then David comes out of the cave a little afterward, and he yells out to Saul and basically says, um, verse 10, I could have killed you. The Lord actually gave you into my 
hand, and some said to kill you, but I had pity on you. I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. I've got a piece of your robe right here. I, I could have taken you out. But in verse 12, look what he says. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. So he right recognizes that there's only one impartial and fair judge. There's only one who can judge and avenge him. And who is that? That's the Lord. That's his Lord. He is not going to, to take it into his own hands to avenge um, the wrong that Saul has against him or the fact that Saul wants to kill him. Besides that, um, he doesn't want to dare kill the Lord's anointed. Yes, the people put Saul in there as king, but who was in charge of that? God was. This was God's anointed king. And so David acknowledges um, again in verse 15, The Lord therefore be judge and decide between you and me, and may he see and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. I'm going to leave it up to the Lord. I could have killed you, Saul, and, and that would have been... I would have been done away. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust the Lord. And He is going to uh, plead my cause. And He's going to deliver me from your hand. And then we see Saul's response. Look at verse 16. David finished saying these things to Saul. And Saul says, Is this your voice, my son David? Saul lifts up his voice and wept, says, and he said to David, You are more righteous than I. You have dealt well with me, while I have dealt wickedly with you. We've heard this before with Saul. In the past, he's even vowed not to harm David after he tried to kill him several times. But see, when there's an evil spirit upon you, and this has happened with Saul multiple times, an evil spirit has come upon a vow doesn't mean anything. When someone's walking in sin, does it? I mean, if you take an evil person and they, they vow to you, you're going to believe them if they're walking in unrighteousness? No, this is what evil people... Evil people actually lie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if we are deceitful as believers, I mean, how much more than those who are really not walking with the Lord... And so here he says, um, I've dealt wickedly with you, even weeps and cries. You have declared today that you have done good to me, that the Lord delivered me into your hand, and yet you did not kill me. If a rich man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safely? May the Lord therefore reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. Verse 20, it's amazing. Saul recognizes that he's going to be king. The kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. Isn't that amazing? But despite his admission, he's not done pursuing David. Not yet. It's, it's did not mean he was ready to give up the kingdom. Even though he acknowledged it here. It's amazing. So he says, Swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. And David swears to Saul. Now, later on, most of Saul's family is actually killed in 2 Samuel, but Saul's line is continued in Mephibosheth. So then that brings us to chapter 25, and this is um, the in-between, that first, that initial sparing of Saul's life, and then the second part in chapter 26. So in verses 1 to 13 of chapter 25, Samuel's death is recorded in verse 1, and that all the house of Israel goes together to Ramah, uh, Samuel's hometown. And then we're told of this narrative where um, there's this rich man named Nabal. His name means fool, and he lives up to his name in this story. Told he's the descendant of Caleb, um, but he lacks Caleb's godliness as we look at his life. He's got a wife, we're told, and she's beautiful. She's intelligent. 
We're told that David and his men protects the flocks of Nabal and sends ten of his men to get a compensation for the good they had done. This is natural. The, uh, David um, is being well known. He is, he, he's known all around Israel. Um, and there's talk of him. His anointed, he's been anointed by Samuel. And he's helped these. He's protected these. We see this later in the text. He's protected this man's property and men. And look at how Nabal responds to David's servants in verse 10. Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. And then he goes on, Who am I to, to repay them? Nabal responds as if ignorant of who David is, which is impossible. I mean, it's impossible that he wouldn't know who David is. David is well known all around. And so um, this angers David. And David says to his men, each of you gird on his sword. So they girded on their sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went up behind David while 200 stayed with the baggage. And then in verses 14 to 17, we'll read this. One of the young men told Abigail, the young men, one of uh, Nabal's men, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us. We were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us. It means they protected us, both by night and by day. All the time we were with them tending the sheep. Verse 17, Now therefore know and consider what you should do. For evil is plotted against our master and against all his household. And he is such a worthless man. He's Nabal. He's living up to his name. He's a fool that no one can speak to him. So in verses 18 um, and following, Abigail intercedes. And without telling Nabal, Abigail prepares a great gift for David and goes to meet him. In verse 21 and 22, we're told here what David was planning to do with him and, and with his 400 men. And he says, Surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David. And more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. So we kind of go back in the story and we're told what David's thought here was when he was insulted and scorned by Nabal. But back to the, the, uh, where we are here. Abigail, she sees David. And um, she goes to him, and she falls at his feet, verse 24, and says in verse 25, Don't let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. He's a fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Verse 26. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now, if I'm reading this right, uh, David hasn't actually communicated that he's restrained. And yet Abigail is speaking in such a way as the Lord has already restrained David from doing this. And this idea of restraint comes up again um, in verse 33. Just jump ahead. Blessed be, David says to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. And then in verse 34, Nevertheless, as the Lord of God Israel lives, who has restrained me 
from harming you. Unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely you would, there would have not been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. And then in verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord is restraining David here, and he recognizes this. Um, in verse 28, she says, uh, Abigail says, Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you all your days. Abigail recognizes, this is Davidic covenant language here. And he, she recognizes that David is the Lord's anointed. Um, David fought the battles of the Lord. In verse 30, when the Lord does, does for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken. Abigail has heard this. How in the world did Abigail hear this and Nabal not know anything about David? Well, he was being evil and wicked when he said he had never heard of this son of Jesse. But he, see, she says in verse 34 that the Lord is going to appoint you ruler over Israel. And so um, we go on, and as I read, David uh, proclaims to her, Thank you, you have, you have restrained me. The Lord has used you, Abigail, to restrain me. And he goes on, and um, Nabal is not spared uh, the Lord, she goes back and tells Nabal, and he is drunk, and actually she can't tell him until the morning because he's just partying and drunk, has no idea the evil and the wickedness that he has done and what his wife has done, but she tells him, and we're told in verse 37, his heart died within him, so he became as a stone, and he lived like this for ten days, and then the Lord struck him, and he died. David ends up marrying Abigail, and um, we're told he had also married another. And in verse 44, he had married Michael, but David, but, but Saul had given Michael to another. We see Michael come back in the picture later. Um, but that brings us to David sparing Saul, part 2, chapter 26. And on your handout, I've got, and on here, 1 through 14, but where it actually goes to the end of the chapter, verse 25. But look at chapter 26. Um, so some Ziphites come to Saul at Gibeah and they say, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon? So Saul arises and went down to the wilderness of Ziph. Wait a second. Saul is already, he wept and he said, Surely you're going to be the, the Lord's going to give you the kingdom, David. How wicked have I been? How righteous have you been? And here we are again, and some, some Ziphites come to him and say, David's over there, and all of a sudden it's like the dog who sees a squirrel, you know, a squirrel, you know, and he's back on. He's back on the pursuit of David. Isn't that the way sin works sometimes? We even, as believers, walk in in the spirit walking in the spirit but we fall um, and then we we the holy spirit within us gives uh gives conviction and we turn and we're walking in the spirit and then oh man the flesh gets us again and it's like squirrel and we go back and this is david i mean this is saul here he says he arises and he goes down to the wilderness and he's got 3,000 chosen men. Why does he have 3,000 men? Because he's trying to kill David. The very one who he says is righteous and is going to get the kingdom. I mean, this is foolish, right? I mean, sin is this way. Sin is so stupid. <laughs> it's stupid when we sin. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. And so Saul camps and... Um, David sends out some spies here, and they know that, they, that Saul's coming. And David arose, and he comes to the place where Saul's camping. And David sees the place where he lays, and they're sleeping, and 
all of all of these men of Saul are sleeping around. They're all camped around him. And David said, verse 6, to Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai the son of Abishai, 